don't mess with a bench scientist when she's busy doing work on orbit. <laughs> How can DNA help us keep astronauts healthy and also help us search for life on other planets? Well, today, with the help of some NASA scientists and an astronaut, we're going to find out. They let me talk to an astronaut. But first, let's talk to some NASA scientists about DNA sequencing, the process of reading all the different letters of DNA, and about why NASA is interested in doing this aboard the International Space Station. Um, I'm Sarah Wallace, and I am a microbiologist at the Johnson Space Center. Um, we are responsible for making sure that the ISS um, stays relatively microbially clean, and so we screen the food and the hardware and the cargo. So why then is NASA interested in sequencing in space? There's a lot of reasons. So first, from my standpoint as a microbiologist, right now we're able to quantify the types of the amount of organisms on the ISS, and we do that by the astronauts actually culture them. So think old school, think in your basic micro 101 class when you have your petri dish, and you're growing up your bacteria and your fungi, that's what the astronauts do. That gives us a count of how many is there, but we have no idea what they are until those samples get back to my lab. So at that point, we then identify them. We use biochemical methods or sequencing. So if we had a sequencer in flight, we would know what was growing before, without having to send the samples back. Um, we also don't have any way to diagnose infectious disease. So if a crew member gets sick, it's up to them to talk with their flight surgeon and kind of figure out what it is. Um, if we had the sequencer and could help diagnose that, that would of course lead to what kind of treatment and, and all those things. We think a, an instrument like a miniaturized DNA sequencer might have practical applications for the search for life. I mean, we have every uh, reason with the, the numbers of planets that are being discovered almost on a daily basis by the Kepler uh, mission and other planned missions from NASA that are looking to other sources. We have every reason to believe that we're, we're not really special in terms of at least the number of planets in the galaxy and in the universe. I don't think it's a great leap to uh, therefore assume that if there are lots of planets and the same sort of ingredients are available on those planets that you might have uh, the right circumstances to uh, allow life to emerge. The question is how do we go about detecting that? Okay, so DNA sequencing can help us keep astronauts healthy on board and also help us to find life beyond our own planet. But before we go any further, let's back up to talk about what DNA sequencing really means. DNA is like the instruction book for life, and it's in every living thing. You, your dog, a potato, bacteria, fungus, everything. And it's the instructions coded in that DNA that make you you, and your dog a dog, and a potato a potato. Your DNA codes all of these instructions with just four letters, A, T, C, and G. Each of these letters is actually a different little molecule, or base, all hooked together into long strands of DNA. So if you were to read down a strand of your own DNA, it would just be A, T, A, C, C, G, A, T, T, C, A, G, G, A, T, C, A, G, G, A, T, T, C, A, G, 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 and on and on for billions of letters. No, we can't read all these letters of DNA just by looking at it. Instead, we have to do something called DNA sequencing, where we use special machines, or sequencers, to do the reading for us. By figuring out the sequence of letters in a DNA sample, we can start to figure out what that DNA encodes for. It's a lot like reading a book, letter by letter by letter. Once you know what all the letters are and what order they're in, you can start to figure out what words and sentences and paragraphs they make up, and figure out whether or not that book is about you, or your dog, or a potato. So tell me a little bit more about the sequencer itself. Out of yeah. all the sequencers, why was it the one that was chosen? So, could we grab it? Yeah, is it in my purse? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I just pulled the sequencer out of my purse, so that kind of should answer the question as to why this one. So this is the Minion from Oxford Nanopore Technologies, and we really chose it because it's portable. So this is the uh, the Minion uh, Nanopore uh, DNA sequencer um, that we've been using on the International Space Station. Um, and then here's kind of the, the conventional state-of-the-art um, uh, benchtop sequencer, uh, the MySeq. Um, so this weighs uh, I think on the order of about 100 grams, uh, and this one weighs about 120 pounds. So there's kind of a, a ballpark estimate that uh, it costs about $10,000 a pound uh, to fly something uh, into space or deliver it to orbit. For, for that reason and many others, kind of the Minion is really the only sequencer that we could have uh, flown to the ISS. So within the sequencer, there's this little um, window, and within it, in this flow cell, this is where all the sequencing chemistry takes place. There are 2,048 nanopore proteins. And so they're actually these little pores that are within this membrane that the DNA passes through. It's in a buffer, and that buffer contains some salts. 
we also have an electric current that's applied and so it creates a current of what's going through those pores. Whenever a DNA molecule passes through the pore, it blocks it and therefore it changes the current. So that change in current is detected and it's changed into, we have the software that changes it into whether it's an A, a G, a T, or a C, and that's how we get our DNA sequence. Last year with this tiny sequencer aboard the International Space Station, NASA successfully sequenced DNA in space for the very first time. And the astronaut who did this sequencing was Dr. Kate Rubens. And for some crazy reason, NASA let me fly on down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston to actually meet Dr. Rubens and sequence DNA with her. Um, the hardware that we have on orbit is actually um, just the MinION sequencer itself, and you can see this hardware right here. Um, and it's just got a little bit of Velcro on it. We can't, on orbit, you can't really put anything down on the, the uh, bench top. Um, but this actually allowed these guys, they did the sequencing almost on the wall. And so it was a little computer laptop desk that comes out from an arm. And uh, both the tablet and the sequencer are just stuck on this laptop desk. And when I did the, um, the loading, uh, it was actually interesting because uh, when you do the loading on the ground, you would just get your pipette and you would come up and you would load the sample. And you wouldn't really think about the reaction force that you put into your loading. But when you're loading a uh, sequencing reaction in space, anything that you press down, it, it wants to shoot you away with an equal and opposite reaction. So I actually had to find a handrail underneath the sequencer and tuck my feet into that handrail. Um, and then I could uh, kind of crouch down and offset my pipetting forces. So you don't really understand actually how much force that you put when, you are, when you're pipetting and trying to keep air bubbles out of the reaction mixture. So this is what we used um, on board and the syringe came in two versions. The first one was just an empty syringe and we actually would use that to withdraw any air and so you're just pulling back on the syringe and you can see here I'm, I'm using gravity to brace. It's actually much easier on the planet than it is on board um, and you're just pulling back a little bit until you see some fluid in the tip so that you make sure that all the f there's no air bubbles in here at all. So then once you've withdrawn liquid, um, you'll just take uh, your sample and then it's just a matter the library is prepped um, of getting all of your liquid down in and then just loading the sample. So this is actually, this is the first time I've loaded a cell back on the ground. It is lovely to load on the ground. You can tell this thing is actually designed for Earth because uh, you know, you can, you can hold this firmly and, and you're not, I'm not flying up towards the ceiling. If I was in space, I would be up in the ceiling tiles for just this amount of force. We didn't want people to think, oh, this is only for microbes. It's bacteria and weird things. It, it's anything. At, at the level of, of sequencing, DNA is DNA is DNA. It doesn't matter where it came from. So what we included in the sample was DNA from a bacteria, a virus, and a mouse. Just to really, all in one sample, all three organisms hold genomic DNA. We had uh, folks here on the ground that prepped that and split the samples and then sent identical replicates uh, on board and at the same time uh, performed the sequencing on the ground as we were doing it in space. And you can start to see the data come in right away and it's a, it's a histogram and I was incredibly nervous the first time and I was on the loops uh, with these guys here and I was calling down and I was like, you know, is it working yet? Is it working? How, how is it working? Like, what's the quality score? Uh, and so they were giving me, they were pretty excited when they saw the data come through and were giving us updates that, yeah, it was actually, uh, it was actually working. You can see the histogram in real time. So um, we let the reaction go for about six hours. I tried to go eat dinner and then I kept, kept coming back and checking it to see how it was going and, and uh, I was babysitting it until I went to bed to make sure everything was good. And you start to see data right away and it starts showing you the distribution and, and the relength. A lot of what I was looking at was the number of events and so that's you know, roughly equivalent to uh, the bases that you've sequenced before it's gone through all the data processing. Uh, and so you can see that, that number tick up and we'd you know, be looking at it, say 30,000, we'd come back the next day and say 70,000. And so um, that was pretty exciting to see that grow and to know that we were actually generating huge amounts of data in just these you know, six hour runs or 48 hour runs. So kind of the, the next step and what we're focusing on flying um, in the spring time frame this year is uh, being able to take uh, say uh, microbial cells or something and be able to lyse them and do a library prep in a very simple uh, process. In principle, we're envisioning that the workflow from, you know, collecting the sample uh, to starting the sequencer will take on the order of like three to four hours um, for a sample, and then you start getting the data right away. Um, 
And so uh, Kate had mentioned the process of bringing samples down every three months, um, you know, and then having to get them and analyze them in the lab. And then you say, okay, so three months ago, this was what was in the, the potable water supply, or this is what was on that surface. Now we can say in a matter of hours that, oh, you know, this is what's there. And, um, it's no big deal or yeah we should probably you know clear that up and this is the best way to you know actually treat that so my uh, sort of uh, long-term interest is to use uh, sequencing to look for life uh, elsewhere uh, the nice thing about you know the hardware is it's a very small architecture um, you've got the little nanopores that do the the sequencing and so I'd like to send it to say Mars or Europa or some uh, planetary surface where we think uh, you know life might exist it was pretty funny, Jeff floated past actually. He knew I was doing something big that day and I'm like, Jeff, we're gonna sequence DNA in space. And he's like, okay, that's cool. And then he, he actually had the video camera out and he was, trying to, he was trying to film something and I was like, back off, I'm doing science here. I mean, I don't disturb me when I'm concentrating on loading this, uh, this channel. He's like, you were, like, this was probably the most serious I've seen you in space flight is, you know, trying to make sure that when you load it, it happens perfectly. I said, don't. Don't mess with the bench scientist when she's busy doing work on orbit. <laughs> huge, huge thank yous to everybody who was involved in the making of this video. First and foremost, the Google Making in Science team and their hashtag Science Goals campaign for supporting this video. You guys rock. Second of all, of course, to all of the NASA scientists and astronauts who talked to me for this video. I appreciate that you guys sat down and let me geek out about genetics with you for hours. That was fantastic. And also huge thank yous to all the people behind the scenes at NASA, especially in the public affairs office, who helped to make this video possible. Also, a special shout out to Destin of Smarter Every Day, without whose pep talks and support, this video would not be nearly as cool as it is. And also to all of you for watching and subscribing and sharing these videos, and to my Patreon supporters for helping me to continue to create stuff like this. I appreciate your support of all forms so much more than you can imagine. I could not do any of this without you guys watching and subscribing and sharing all the time. And I appreciate it so, so much. Huge thank you. Go forth and do science in space.